all welcome to today's cancer healing journey talks myself annie jones from community outreach team of zenonco.io and love this cancer cancer healing journey talks helps cancer survivors and caregivers to share their journey with vast number of survivors and caregivers who have traveled or been traveling through this journey this can inspire and motivate them for their faster recovery as well firstly i would like to introduce today's speaker alfred samuels welcome alfred to today's session. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, he's a metastatic prostate cancer survivor. He's a volunteer for Cancer Research UK. Uh, so he's a volunteer for Cancer Research UK. He actively seeks changes in current legislation and stigmas associated with cancer, particularly within the Black, Asian, and minority ethnic communities. His efforts were rewarded in 2019 when he was awarded the Flame of Hope Award, which recognizes people's outstanding contributions to the work they do for the charity. In his book, Motivated to Inspire a Cancer Survivor's Perspective, he has shared some experiences that cancer sufferers are likely to go through and provide inspiration advice to encourage people to think differently as well. I'm happy that you're here with us, Alfred, to share your journey with us. Over to you. Please start with your introduction and then you can start sharing the story. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I I don't really know where to start with my journey. I mean, when you have cancer, you face two battles. Um, one being the illness itself. Um, the other, living in a world where few people understand what you're up against. Most days I accept the reality of living with my illness. Um, I accept and I adapt to my limitations. Um, most, that's most days. Um, prostate cancer is a crisis in the black community right now. Every year, thousands of our men die from prostate cancer and tens of thousands suffer harm to their quality of life from prostate cancer treatments. Um, I, 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 I would say to you that I'm the, vo I'm the voice for the voiceless. Um, I tell the tales of hope, motivation and inspiration in the fight against this deadly disease that disproportionately affects black men. Um, I'm a passionate patient advocate, I'm an author, and also a volunteer. Um, in 2012, I received an unexpected and untimely stage four diagnosis with a presenting PSA of 509. For someone of my age at the time, which was 54, my PSA should have been between two and four. Um, I repeat again, my PSA was 509. I was told to shift my thinking to short term rather than long term. But despite this, as you can see, I'm very much alive and kicking with my cancer now well managed almost 10 years later, though with a few side effects. Some of those side effects are the loss of muscle, uh, muscle mass, the, the, the pains that I still continue to get in my lower back region, um, the medication that I'm on has really um, torn apart my whole testosterone um, in my body. Um, because I'm on a testosterone reducing agent. And believe me, 
it can play havoc with your life. These are just some of the side effects. However, I've got my life. And I suppose that's something to, to count for. Excuse me. Um, my patient experience, it's not been a smooth one. There have been times where I believe that the care I receive and the empathy towards myself and my wife with regards to what we were facing was sometimes absent by some medical professionals. And on a particular occasion, we had to raise an official complaint. But that's one individual amongst many who were totally professional. Since being diagnosed, I've de dedicated myself to raising awareness of the importance of continued research. Over several years now, I have given advice, support, and awareness to men who have unfortunately followed a similar path. I'm an advocate who works tirelessly to bring that all important patient voice to the, com to the conversation, um, ensuring I am heard loud and clear. I'm highly motivated, extremely knowledgeable, and I have two books to my name, um, Motivated to Inspire, and also Invincibility in the Face of Prostate Cancer, coming out the other side. I wrote these books to inspire, motivate, uplift, and educate men and their families about the disease. In all the work that I've been doing with advocacy, writing my books and researching what has been happening with me, I notice that these, there are different avenues and organizations that I was working with and I realize that there seemed to be a lack of diversity of individuals taking part in these programs or research opportunities. I can recall two projects that I was involved in. I went along with my wife to an event with prostate cancer, which was discussing a new treatment being proposed in a room of a dozen men also, I was the only black male in the room. I was also involved in a film project around diversity where I, I was only one of two black men out of 20 plus men at the event. I mean, to, to, to take it further, the other um, male, black male that was in that room was there because I invited him. You see, the problem was the organizers could not find other black men to participate. And that is a dire problem with many research pro uh, projects. In speaking to those who I have been involved with about research and diversity, what they are saying is that they do struggle to get people who look like me, black and brown people. I believe this disadvantage causes many issues with males um, and their treatment given. You see, if we do not expose ourselves to the treatments, then how can they say that they work for us? I can only 
add that diverse groups has got to be the way forward. And the powers that be need to listen more intently to what we are saying and what needs to be done for all people of color. I would want to say, as a result, I've now become quite involved in the area, this area of work. And I'm quite passionate about it, as you can probably hear. But what I'm finding is that I think that those undertaking the research pro projects may be using the same tried and tested methods for recruiting to these projects and therefore are not getting the desired effects. For example, the recruitment of a more diverse cohort some of my thoughts around improving diversity on research projects are as follows. I mean, the first thing that you need to have is to have trusted people in these communities that are going to be recognized, listened to and be respected. Because if you are constantly being faced with people who don't look like you, them, I'm sorry to say, but it's not going to work. There is a great mistrust in a lot of research because of historically what's gone on before in areas. We also have to know different communities are in different places. And we already know there is a lot of inequity around health finance and social injustices with black and brown communities. So therefore, to recruit these people and retain them into research projects, you have to go to them. Don't expect them always to come to you because that may not happen. I, I and others like me would like to see people that look like us come in to talk to us about participating in research. Some of the reasons are stigmas, right? May be broken down. And sometimes you think that may be preconceived ideas that some people may have are not necessarily going to be there. I'm not saying that I'm right, but this is how I'm saying I would feel and others. A good example of this for me was during my journey, I had a consultant that happened to look like me, a black male. We got on very well. When I was first referred to my cancer treatment center, he was part of the team that I was referred to. And we just seemed to get on very well. I felt he understood me from the start in regards to my culture, my food, my lifestyle, and the way I was. He demonstrated empathy towards me. And I was going to listen to him more when he said something and advised something to me than potential others. I'm not saying other consultants did not know what they were doing, but there was just something about the connection that we had because he spoke to me in my language and I felt a huge bond and trust develop with this consultant. When you first meet your doctor consultant, you need to listen to your gut feeling and decide if this is the medical profession, professional for you. Your medical professional 
is your partner in the business of destroying your cancer while maintaining your quality of life. A medical professional can't fix what they don't know. If you feel that the two of you cannot, and I repeat, cannot have an open and stress-free conversation, then you need to find yourself with someone with whom you can establish a better relationship. Your best chance of treating your prostate cancer is with a medical professional that listens to you and does not rush you into decisions you are not ready to make. Remember that when choices are limited, you might have to compromise. Your cancer cells don't care what your medical professional looks like. Your cancer cells only fear those with the best skill set and the most effective therapies to destroy them. Consider thinking of your prostate cancer disease as a chronic illness to manage with a variety of treatments, one after the next as needed. By monitoring yourself with blood tests and an occasional scan, you'll be ready to jump on the next course of treatment at an advantageous time if your, if your cancer progresses. By thinking of your prostate cancer as a chronic disease, you'll be less likely to feel disappointment, anxiety, and depression if you need additional treatments. You see, all of what I said to you is all what I've experienced now for the past 10 years. January 2022 will mark 10 years of a survival that originally the prognosis was six months. So you see, I've done incredibly well, but also I've become very knowledgeable in the ways and means of this journey. In finishing, I would like to say, I'm a man who without clinical research and the treatments that have been developed for this research, I would not be here today. And I would like to see others like me also have the opportunity to participate in this very important work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much for your valuable time, Arthur. I'm sure the session would be really motivating people out there who have traveled or been traveling through cancer. So it was lovely having you here today. And once again, thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you now.